Hello and welcome again. Uh, this is a follow-up tutorial to the tutorial uh, that you can check out on my channel um, that's titled Cavalry Illustrator After Effects HUD Design. Um, there was a few features in that build I was using that um, I alluded to but weren't actually in the build so I just wanted to come in quickly again and show you what I was talking about um, and I believe this um, these features will be in the next build of Cavalry. So if you haven't got the most recent versions, hopefully by the time you view this, it will be out. If not, don't worry. Um, the release is coming out shortly. That's 1.2, I believe, on the Cavalry release. So let's dive into it. Again, you can have any kind of design you want, as long as it's an SVG. You can have as many as you want for this little kind of method to work. So at the moment, I've got the design that you can see in the other um, tutorial that we did and um, we designed it in that and we go over all of that in Illustrator as well and um, so basically what I'm doing just to change the uh, the aspect ratio of this uh, project settings is we go into this little button here you can see it's like a little kind of sideways abacus in the scene window and um, so you can click on that and you've got your resolution here um, I won't do. I won't go through um, these other settings just because I. I'm pretty sure that Scene Group have um, some really good tutorials explaining these kind of things in depth, and the documentation is really good as well. So I don't really want to patronise you guys with too much of that stuff. But I'll shout out shortcuts as I'm doing them. I'm using a tablet to um, to do all of the stuff on this. I'm just getting used to it. So if I'm a bit slow and a bit sloppy, uh, bear with me. If you hold down Alt when you click on this it will make the aspect ratio lock together so you can do it if you take your finger off alt then hold up down on alt you're all good or you can just type it in and then if you when you press return hold down alt it will make them constrained to each other so that's great uh, for some reason my SVG has come in a bit not in the center so let's just eyeball this and we'll pop it down in the center oh and this was a bigger resolution so let's do, let's set it correctly. Okie dokie, great. It looks absolutely terrible when it comes in like this because this design is full of strokes and what it's doing is applying a fill. Um, so if you double click on your uh, SVG object in the scene window, come over to your attributes editor, which is over here, as you can see. And this is where all of, this is where the kind of parameters will sit and um, it's where you can make all of your adjustments. The same things go across Cavalry for shortcuts. Again, if we hold down the Alt button and move any of these, it locks in those two things. So they, they do the same thing. Same goes for scale. All of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so we are not going to use these two materials. By default, when you bring in an SVG, it gives it an SVG material, which is the fill, and an SVG struck. We don't need either of these because we are going to be overtaking. And again, it's the same as the other tutorial. So if you've already watched this, there's not going to be too much in this for you. Um, but then this uh, is the stroke that you get with the SVG. So you can turn that off and have a bit more independent control. Um, and you have a load of settings here, you know, like width and color and how you want the, the, the caps to be, all, all of that kind of stuff. We are not going to use this, though, because we are going to break this apart and do the animation all in one and add a nice random effect there on with something that's called a sub mesh. So what we're going to do, we're going to go into the deformers. There's a nice little button here to add stuff in. You just click the plus and uh, as you can see, they've got a shed load of behaviors and deformers and all really cool stuff. I mean, I don't even know where to begin with explaining some of these things. Uh, it's better to just kind of show you in practical terms. So. Today, we'll look at the sub mesh. That's going to be where we're controlling absolutely everything. Let's just do a bit of housekeeping here and uh, rename this Art Work. And so we know. And then the sub mesh is the sub mesh, and uh, that's fine for a name. So if we open up the sub mesh, oh, this pen, dude. Right, got to double click. Uh, you open up the sub mesh here. So basically, what the sub mesh is doing. Let me just turn the stroke back on for a second so we can see what's happening. Woohoo, Nelly, let's turn that down. Um, so the sub mesh is essentially, uh, it's looking at the SVG shape that we've put into, that the sub mesh has gone into, and it's saying, well, it's all one big SVG shape, but I know that these lines are actually separate things. 
So what that um, the sub mesh is doing is basically saying, well, now I'm going to treat this SVG as though it was separate objects. So this line is a different object to this line and things like that. So we can then have independent control over um, each one of these lines um, in a kind of more procedural and fun way. So we don't need to come in and you know do everything one by one. So let's uh, let's kind of dive in. I had a little bit of trouble with these level modes, uh, but I'll explain in a minute um, what that was and what I think it does, because I'm still not sure and I should have checked. I did promise to do that, but I lied. Uh, so we had the stroke back in, and as you can see, it's half of the designs disappeared. Um, and there's no, you can see that it's still here if we hover over it. The design's all there, but it, it's disappeared. And the way we kind of get around that, we need to come into level mode and change that to all. And then that's going to make it so we can see all of it. I will touch base with, um, I don't know, some of the documentation. And I would advise looking at the documentation for the sub mesh node. Maybe that will have some kind of better uh, word and answer for you guys about what that does. Um, so now, essentially, what we have here is one SVG ship is broken down into all its component parts. Now, what we want to do as animators is, is animate this as quickly as possible and have it look as good as possible. So let's let's dive right in. So we're going to go into Stroke, and unlike in After Effects, where we'd have to double-click into this hierarchy, go all the way down, find Stroke, and then add a Trim Paths, and get into all of that kind of stuff, we have it right here. We just click on Trim Paths, and... Wow, look at that. They all just come in and do their thing and you know, we have a really nice playback in in uh in the viewport. Um and you'll find with cavalry that it tends to be quite quick and uh it is always um uh, is that working? Yeah. It usually gives you pretty uh good feedback in the viewport unless you start adding a crazy amount of shapes and a crazy amount of vertices. Um then you do see a slowdown, but it's you have to go pretty high with the numbers to kind of see a significant reduction. Uh, but the moment, our problem is that they all move together. They all start at the same time. They all end at the same time. So let's to start off with just set two keyframes on frame zero. And I like to set the start and end at 50 um, because it means then that the lines start from the middle and go out instead of starting from just one end. So you get kind of more even motion. Um, alongside you don't have to do it this way again that's more of a taste thing than it is a uh, necessary thing to do and then do that so come down 30 frames is usually a good amount of time for these kind of animations it's it's quick but not too quick and so it gives you enough time for the eye to register some of these things but you'd have to watch that more than once to really hone in on anything and that's nice uh, we'll just play that back oh had a little bit of a slowdown there I think that's more to do with my set uh, I believe that bug's getting fixed. You son of a bitch. That's going to be annoying. Ah, uh, might be because I've got cached. Um, let me just do this. So what that was there, this button here, and maybe I'll go through what all these other ones do um, when I've worked out or when I know what they actually do. This is cache playback. So what that means is when you press play, and you haven't changed anything in the attribute editor, it's going to play your your animation and it's going to cache up until whatever frame you stop the exact thing that happened in the viewport. And then it's going to play that back so it doesn't have to work it out every time. So then it would only recalculate if you make a change in the attribute editor or you add a new node into the seed window. The seed window? The scene window. Um, so now it's not doing that horrible viewport bug that we saw. And there we go. So you can see that looks nice, but as before in the other tutorial, what we want to do is to add a nice curve, add a nice curve to the animation path. So at the moment, they're not framed very nicely in the graph editor. So what we can do is select these and press F as a hockey, and it just makes it you know a little bit nicer for us to um, view the, the curves, just so we can kind of see them a little better. If you right click on the curves, uh, you can, I'll do that again, if you right click on the curves, you get a nice little drop down menu and there's a bunch of stuff you can do with um, 
with cavalry, um, magic easing, loop before and after. Again, there's no expressions with cavalry. This is the kind of thing that I really want to hammer home with anyone watching. I never write expressions. I rarely keyframe anything. Um, the only time that it's necessary to keyframe something is for something like this when you're animating something on or off. Um, but there's plenty of examples of cavalry scenes that I've done that have no keyframes and are constantly full and constantly looking like they're evolving and doing more than they actually are. So, but that's how you make a curve, a Bezier curve, and you've got linear and step, but Bezier is what we want for right now. So, grab them all, and I think I'm right in saying if I hold down shift and grab the handle and pull it in, it will snap so it's flat and we can let it go. And we've got a nicer curve, so it starts off slow and then it ramps up really quick and then it slows down towards the end. So, Let's have a little watch of that back. There you go. And it looks a bit nicer and it looks a bit more professional, which is the main thing. That's what we want to do. We want a nice, the easiest way to make something look good, the lazy man's way. And that is one of the ways. But now the problem is that they all happen at the same time. That's not very interesting because anyone can animate the lines to all happen at the same time. It's not the most uh, complicated looking thing to do. So what we're going to do, and this is where cavalry is really good, we're going to make all of these random. Uh, with a random node and uh, the way we do that is we come over here and you can see in the sub mesh, the sub mesh can control a bunch of stuff it can control the position of the overall shape or the individual parts of the bigger shape and I'll tell you what, just, ooh, what the hell sorry, this tablet is go away dude no that's interesting um, so what we can do here, and what I'll show you guys, is just what I mean about how the sub mesh is breaking this down. So if we go in here and we right click on position, we can add a behavior in. And there's a bunch of behaviors that can only affect position. And if you see um, something appear in a drop down menu, it means it can affect the thing that you can see it in the drop down menu for. Like it won't let you put something, or it shouldn't let you put a behavior on something that it won't affect. So at the moment, what, let's say, let's use a noise just animated random right so as you can see here it's moving all of these pieces randomly and I mean that looks pretty cool it's kind of cool effect if that's what you're going for you're going for a kind of I don't know like a weird jelly like animation it's kind of nice but there's really annoying bits here like where uh, you know there's been bits of the design that meet nicely and end up being flush that come out of whack and end up looking a bit shoddy um, and obviously that's different to if I added and the reason that is different is because let's take that off and set these all back to zero and let's add a noise into the original artwork we add a noise behavior into here it's going to move it all as one or oh, it should do there you go so you can see it's moving it all as one and it's not nearly as interesting Great, so let's eliminate that. And when you add things here in the attribute editor, they immediately get added into the hierarchy. Um, have you seen window down here? And it does its best to kind of name stuff in a way to make it not confusing. But obviously, when these scenes get bigger and more complicated, these are really helpful to um, be labeled correctly uh, and explicitly. Um, and they have a really great method for actually organizing these things and that's called tabs. Um, I won't get into that now because it's, it's a tutorial to itself and I'm 100% certain that Ian from Scene Group or someone from Scene Group has done a great tutorial on exactly how to use them and they are fantastic. It's one of the best ways to kind of navigate and organize your scenes, um, especially if they're busy, especially if they're big. So uh, definitely check out that tutorial. I'll try and remember to put links in for these things just so you guys don't have to trawl through um, tutorialists to find them. So let's just put this back in zero and get on with the tutorial as we were saying we were going to do it. Just move that back into the center. That's probably my bad for exporting it. So what we're going to do is we're not going to use random and things to affect the position. You could, but we're going to use it to do time. So we're going to come down here into time offset. I really should have hidden that. Um, we're going to come down here into time offset and uh, add in a, um, a random effector. And what the random effect is going to do is, um, or behavior, sorry, I'm used to kind of cinema speak. Um, the random effector, if I can double click it, sorry, again, poor etiquette with the pen. The random effector will randomly stagger the start 
points of the animation that we've set. So as you can see here, the animation happens between 0 and 30 seconds. If we were to set the maximum to 20 seconds, it means it's going to offset the time by 20 seconds that that happens. Now, good practice is just to, whatever you add in the maximum is to subtract it away in the offset, which will mean you'll start from a clean space. And then if we do this, look at that. They all kind of happen and start to come on in different ways. How nice is that? That is very nice. I'm glad you agree. I think it's pretty cool. So, but let's, let's extend that and make it more. I hate why that's doing that. Whatever that is. Um, let's just get rid of that. Minus 30. I'm going to have to find out why the pen is doing that. Because I don't want to sketch things in. Um, yeah. So, look at that. That looks quite nice. Now, there are interesting things that we can do with the sub mesh that... Um, Again, I'm probably not the best place to start messing about with right now because I didn't test this before I started doing it. But say if we wanted to not have it be random, but we wanted to run this with a fall off. So a fall off works the same way as it does in Cinema 4D. And this is why um, Cavalry is a really nice middle ground between these programs. It has things like fall offs and it has things like behaviors. It's it's almost like MoGraph in a lot of ways. It's like, it's, it, it's got elements of Houdini. Uh, kind of like 2 d and and um, they've got nice things that will be kind of interesting if you have come from a 3D background to try and work out. Um, so I'm not exactly sure, I'm pretty sure I'm doing this in the wrong way um, because we'd have to, let's, yeah. Yeah, so say if we wanted, to, we'll take that off. This is just a demonstration. This is a little bonus for you guys. Um, Cavalry's got a bunch of cool things you can do. Oops, sorry, I'm using shortcuts and not explaining how I'm doing it. Bad, bad practice. If you hold control, full stop, it will pop up this little window. And it's like holding Shift C in cinema, or uh, After Effects might have one. I've never bothered to learn it. But yeah, it opens up a little window, press it any time, and you can just come in and type what you want to see. And what we want to do is an animation control. Oh, it already added one. So an animation control is going to give us a slider, value 1 to 100. And we can attach an animation to this. So what we're going to do, we're going to go back into the sub mesh and go back into the uh, stroke. And just for the purpose of this, because I think it'll be easy, we'll just do it all from one. So we'll do one to a hundred. There we go. There we go. And it is r again randomly offsetting these things because we've got that already set up. Oh no, it's not. Then why is it not starting? Ah, because in the sub mesh. It's defaulted to 30. There we are. That's good. So within the sub mesh now, we've only got one set of keyframes. But what we can do is take this animation control and attach it to this, which stops these keyframes doing anything. The keyframes have absolutely nothing to do with anything anymore. But now this controls the animation. The animation control is now the, it's like a master control and it's good for joysticks and sliders. You can make kind of more complex controls out of this. But now what we can do, I think, and again, I might not be doing this in the best way, so don't always be looking for me. This fall off node is controlling the sub mesh. No, it's not because the animation control isn't connected into it. Huh. We control this with a value, add a value, <laughs> add a value into the animation control and set that value at 100. Take the fall off out of the sub mesh, go into your value, add the fall off into there. Oh my giddy aunt, what is this madness? I mean, that's, that's pretty cool, right? So what the fall off is doing is controlling the animation. So it's saying within that circle, we want uh, the animation to happen as the circle passes through. So the middle of the circle is the animation is completely finished. The outside of the circle is the animation hasn't started. So if we take this fall off and we smash a lovely, lovely noise into the position of that and add some bigger numbers, what we're going to find is that the animation 
randomly starts and finishes as we go. Now at the moment you'll notice that it's not being applied only in the circle of the fall off and that is because of a more advanced feature if we come up here and go into advanced. If we turn off position and we turn off incoming index, there we go, it gives us the effect only within the confines of the fall off itself. And we can make that bigger so we kind of get something good um, that you know you can see a little bit better so it, it actually finishes before it goes out. Now if we only wanted it, if we wanted there to be less of a fall off we can just come in here and do things like this and we can swap them around. Cavalry is really great, this is um, a context graph I believe is what they like calling it and um, you can just change these curves. They've got a couple of presets down here but then you can flip and reverse those presets so um, you don't have to manually do stuff, you, can, you don't have to really touch stuff. And then we can just press play. And look at that, we've got a never ending, random uh, animation of a kind of hard, weird kind of graphics thing. And what we can do is uh, come into that noise and we can loop the noise. So the noise we've added to the value, to the fall off position, we can come into there and uh, there's a little looping tab here that you can see and we can click that and uh, it's going to then loop this at 250 but say we don't want it at 250 we want to loop it at 50 let's loop it at 50 because we don't have time so we're waiting all day it's going to be super quick that is because it's trying to work itself out and the way that the uh, I don't know the algorithms make it do it so I find if you do loop stuff you kind of need to drop it down to about a quarter of the speed that you had originally and it will give you um, a looping bit of randomly generated noise. Um, so, pretty cool. Not what we were doing before, but I thought you guys might be interested. And uh, that is the beauty with Cavalry, is the fact that a lot of the time when I come in to make designs, um, I end up doing something completely different. Um, because Cavalry lets you. Cavalry lets you... Um, start to do something and then end up doing something completely different and um, because it's got the power to be very experimental whereas say if you were doing this in after effects you kind of know what you're doing and uh you go towards one end and there's less time for experimenting in this way i mean you can experiment in after effects but it's you you, you couldn't do this kind of thing in um cavalry let me just set that back up quickly what we had before um because we have uh deviated slightly from the tutorial so again to show you again we go into the sub mesh into the time offset add a random go into the random in the maximum put whatever value you like but I like to do kind of this and it's going to offset these things and ooh, almost forgot about the curves let's select these do this curve interpolation and whoop there we go, just scared my dog making that noise. Great, so what have we got? And this is where we're at. And this is where we got to with the last tutorial and I failed because they didn't have the... Uh, uh, it couldn't do what I wanted to do. Um, but now, it does do what we want it to do. So let's have a look at what that is and what it does. And we're going to use something called a length context node. And basically what the length context node is is a node that tells you um, what um, it looks at how long things are and it's useful when you use nodes like and again we'll go into these in other tutorials maybe connect shapes uh, which connects vertices right like um, makes a cool kind of plexusy effect and there is a node called trails which um, leaves kind of, it's like a simulation -y kind of thing that leaves a trail behind moving vertices um, or center of points and things like that so it's a really useful tool and it does two things um, at least that I use it for there will be other applications just because of the nature of kind of the scope of cavalry but these are the things I use it for so we've got a length context here and it's got a couple of uh, it's got a couple of attributes that uh, I'll quickly talk you through. You've got the remapping type and you've got number range or number range to color. Number range is going to take an input um, and it's going to 
change those numbers and re-output them in a different way. So in this case, the source minimum and maximum is the length of the line. And then the minimum and maximum going out will be the width of the line. Because what we want to do is make the length of the line directly correlate to the width of the line. Um, and it's a really simple way to make the short lines, which are kind of usually a lot more of a fine detail, uh, appear less thick than the long lines, which we want to be more prominent because they're the main elements of it, this design. And because we haven't really considered this design in terms of functionality, uh, we just kind of want to add stuff in as quickly as possible to make it look as good as possible without really needing to think about anything. And length context makes that possible. So we're going to take length context and we're going to pop it in to the sub mesh width. Oh, it works. I'm so happy about this. I, I've never done this before, um, so bear with me. But now, the longest lines are the thickest lines, which is wonderful. So basically, it's this here is what we're telling our line, uh, how long the line is. So we need to kind of find where a good number is for the length of the longest line. Now, we could probably measure this. Let's just go 500. That seems to give us a nice variation. And then what at the moment it's saying the thickest our line can be is 100 wide. We don't want that. In fact, it's definitely not that much. That's probably about more than right. We want our longest line. Uh, we want the maximum width of our line is probably want to be about. Let's change this to 50. Sorry, it's just because I've not used this before. Let's turn this to. That looks pretty good. So again, you guys may not have this design. You may not have made this when I was doing Illustrator. I'd be surprised if you had. It really doesn't matter. It could be any design. But just that's how you get that to do. Um, what we were talking about is just make those lo bit thick, longer lines thicker and the shorter lines the other way. Now, we can flip that easily. We can go into the graph and just say we want to have the, the thick lines, the short ones. And, you know, in fact, that kind of looks a little bit cooler. Or we can start adding in points. Uh, we can go add a point here and just say, well, we want both the short and the long lines to be thin, but the middle lines to be thick. And that actually probably gives us an, a much nicer. That is, that's the nicest one. For me, anyway, that looks the coolest. And look at that. We've got a randomly animating set of lines. That look like this. So let's go back into the project kind of settings here and change the background to black because that's how this kind of artwork is usually viewed and then let's let's apply the same logic to the color we want the middle lines to be a different color to the long and the short lines so let's come into here and make another length context sorry my dog is going mental let me just great um sorry about that uh Dog probs. Um, this. Why have those lines gone mental? Ah, it's because I changed the wrong one to number to color. So make sure you keep the right one. Let's label this one width, and we'll label this one color. Oh, very nice. Now that is going to be easier for us to keep tabs on. So we're going to add this to color. Now, we want to come down, and I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make these colors crazy before we do anything. Um, let's delete those stops. And let's turn this to red. And let's turn you to green. So now we'll be able to see. You're going to want to take this and drag this down into the sub mesh and go to stroke color. And it's going to apply this... Uh, in a different way to how we had it last time. So this is, oh, it might be interesting this because we don't have that remap ability to do with the graph. But basically at the moment, what you can see is it's applying the colors um, onto the lines in, this, in the same kind of way um, because we set the source maximum and minimum to the same. So it will give us the kind of short to long will be different colors. So as you can see, the longest lines are green and the shortest lines are red. Now, what we can do is come into here and just change these as we see fit, um, you know, into 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 the kind of colours you like. So let's maybe go with a kind of let's go with like a cyberpunk vibe 
for this. How good is that, though? I mean, like, it would have taken ages in Capo in in After Effects to do this, and now it's it's a doddle, you know, it's it, it's a doddle to do. Um, so obviously, yeah, as you can see there, it's good. Can I draw with that pen? Give me the pen. Oh, I got a grease pencil. So yeah, you got like the the longest lines. Oh, well, let me do that there and you know the kind of shorter lines are all lovely little um like a blue color um and yeah well self-explanatory really we have lost some lines down here and I, ah that's because our minimum might be set to something <laughs> immediately fixed there we go so look at that that what was happening there was it, those lines were actually zero because they were the longest of all the lines, and so therefore were being given a value of zero. The longest uh, and the shortest lines, then I believe, would be given a value of zero. So we've stopped that from happening, and we've got that. So let me delete all these shapes because that's not helpful. Um, but yeah, guys, that's um, what I wanted to explain yesterday, and it's what I uh, couldn't do. Uh, because of the build but now we have the build and you guys have the tutorial so go forward and make ui stuff um it'd be great to see what you guys make actually um you can hit me up on instagram and all of those other nice things or throw it in the discord group which again i'll link to this tutorial um and you guys can show me what you make um yeah i'd love to see some different designs and interesting ways to use calvary i will get more into there's loads we can do with this particular design um, I'll probably use this as a benchmarking tool just to show you a lot of tools and make different um, things for this particular UI so you guys so we always kind of have something similar to work from maybe I won't as I talk about it, it sounds boring um, but we will we'll see as we go forward uh, thanks again for watching if you do want to know about the other tutorial where we where I design this particular bit of UI and I explain my process and then go into After Effects for the compositing side, that's in a different tutorial. You can check that one out. And again, thank you to the scene group guys for adding features so quickly, uh, making life easier for motion graphics artists and I will link up all their tutorials and places where you can grab Calvary. It's free uh, for the trial versions so um, there's no excuse to not try them out and now you've got people making tutorials. So. The more people we get doing this, the more you know, uh, the more updates they'll get because you know, the more power they'll have because the more money they'll have, um, the more power, more power in our pockets. Really, um, I don't know how long that would have taken in After Effects. It would be good. Maybe I'll do a tutorial where I try and make all of this, you know, purely in After Effects and purely in Cavalry, and we'll see which one takes me longer. But I know the answer to that question. So, uh, all right, nice one. Thank you guys for watching.